Welcome back to another edition of the Twins Podcast, bigger, meatier, and sexier than ever. I am your host, Dr. Pat Davidson, and this is your co-host, Dr. Marcos Rodriguez. We're part of the starting lineup for Hype Jam, and uh, Marcos is the power forward. I'm the point guard. Uh, Who's on the bench? Everybody else. Everyone else. This is a two-man show here. We don't need anybody else. The rest of the Cretans here are really just like... Trondonites. Well said. Well said. Uh, whereas we are the Senators. We run yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what exactly... What, what is Kyle's role in all of this? Uh, subservient? Like... Butler. Just, I've always wanted a butler. Okay, all right. We'll we need to nice give him like a bow tie. Something along those lines. Nice Vincent Price voice here. You know, we were discussing, like, what will be a good topic for today, and uh, and one of the things that we, we got into was actually asking Kyle, what has Kyle learned from his hype gym experience thus far? And uh, we kind of, in the course, Kyle, in his typical Kyle way, was like, I, I don't know, and various things of various types, and like, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, we have to narrow it down, and like, from the power hours that you've watched, what is it exactly that you've taken away? And, and Kyle, if, if you don't mind uh, saying what exactly it is. I uh, said that I thought after a while seeing everybody coach more and more and how we see like more people come in of all different starting points, uh, it really depends on their capabilities, especially talking with beginners because like I was saying, either I've had people on the first day completely gas out after the tempo runs that we usually start off with or... Um, like we were talking about yesterday, what happens if you go through the entire workout in about 15 to 20 minutes and there's nothing left to do and you have 40 minutes left. Mm -hmm. And so that is like a wide spectrum of what to do with a person on the first day. Yeah. And, and I, I do think that this is a really good topic. And like when I'm, when I'm putting together the seminar for rethinking the big patterns, when I'm writing the book, it's a major consideration and a major factor. Do you have a game plan for day one with people? And, and you know, Bill Hartman says a lot of really amazing, really smart things. And one of the best things that I've heard him say is that he's not particularly looking to change what you do. He's not trying to pull activities out that you've had in, in workouts with people previously. He doesn't change what you do, but what he changes is how you do it and why you do it. And if you have a principle-based approach to how you're doing things, you should probably be able to formulate a design for what is the most likely correct version of an exercise to use with someone on day one. Uh, and, and that's what I'm after in, a, in large part too, is like, can we find an activity that through definition of what it is and through principles that guide you towards that decision making is the most likely best choice for someone to do properly. You know, um, in, in Rethinking the Big Patterns 1 that I put together, that one starts off like the beginning of that seminar has all of these theoretical models that I put out there. And, uh, and one of those theoretical models is, is variability. And then the one that follows that one is actually called invariance. And uh, you know, it's kind of, they sound fairly contradictory. Variability obviously means that there's options and more than one way to get the job done. And invariance means that if something is a constant that doesn't change. More specificity? Well, invariance, like the best way for me to get across the topic of invariance is actually through example. And when I'm teaching a seminar, I have everybody sign their name on a piece of paper in front of them. And I say, okay, now take, take the pen and put it on the table, and I want you in front of you in the air to sign your name. And then I say, now I want you to use your elbow, and I want you to sign your name in front of you. And now I want you to point your toe and sign your name in front of you with your toe. And then I have everybody stand up, and I have them sign their name with their zipper. And, uh, you know, you get the crowd involved, have a little fun. It's a goof. It's a, you know. But, um... The point of that is that once you've established a pattern in your brain, and this is a motor pattern, it's it's in there. That thing is, is I don't care how it unfolds and expresses itself in the moment, like you didn't have to relearn the entire concept of the motor command of sign your name, and you've probably never practiced doing it with your elbow before in your life. Not my zipper at least. 
Yeah, I mean, like maybe your your tongue, for instance, like that. I that have might be, that. You know, the alphabet. That idea. But uh, yeah, you can you can just do it. Like your brain is able to create that with whatever part of your body it needs to, because the pattern is in your brain as an invariant representation. It's a constant. It's not changing. And like, would you get better if you practice signing your name with your zipper? Like if I painted your zipper and you signed your name on a piece of paper uh, over and over again, you the first time would probably be sloppy and then you would get much better at it with repetition. Mm -hmm. And that is specificity, you know, but it's kind of like with a squat, for example. That makes sense. Um, you know, the first time that you use a transformer bar, you're like, oh, what the fuck is this thing? Like, this is a little cumbersome. The first time you try to zercher, the first time you try to uh, camber bar, you know, high bar, back squat, low bar, back squat, front squat, overhead squat. But, you know, the point is, is that the concept of squat needs to get lodged in your brain in some way, shape, or form. And it needs to be a concept that is as close to optimal as we can get somebody. Mm -hmm. And when I think about what's as close to optimal as we can get somebody, like I want the skull to be stacked over the pelvic floor. I want the person to uh, demonstrate good dorsiflexion, knees being able to go forward. I want it to be full range of motion. Um, you know, I want them to feel their glutes and quads and core engaged while they're, they're squatting. Uh, and, and if I can pick a variation that allows someone to do all of those things mm -hmm. on day one, that's probably the best option to be able to start them off with. And we're gonna practice that variation over and over and over again to the point where that's the only way they know how to squat. And now when we try a new implement, variability, now it's still the invariant representation mm -hmm. that exists that guides them in how they express this new version of it. So when I say like it depends, kind of, but not really at the same time. You know, it's sort of like we're always starting with like compound lifts. You know, the sort of um, structure is always the same. But I was just saying like how that person is going to execute it will be completely different. For example. I have a, a client of mine that's maybe my favorite, uh, who on a first day came in, like her body was just made to work hard. Like first day, nailed it, barely even had to coach her, and she's made like incredible progress. And then there's other people who they come in, it's very difficult to even perform one rep, and I've tried many things over time, uh, for example, like starting from the first rep, like let's really meticulously uh, try to coach them and over and over and over and it didn't seem to work. And then I found with that person, if I keep letting them do the reps sort of like 70% as well as I want them to, maybe by like the 15th rep, they'll actually somehow like figure it out on the, by themselves, not even with me saying anything. Um, but then other people need more cues, more coaching. So it's like figuring out in your own how to get this person to do what they want. Um, and that's the like the difference with every single yeah. person. It sort of like translates differently. Well, communication is it's a very interesting thing. I just got a puppy. The whole world knows. Uh, we've had him for a year now, and he's my first dog ever. I got him at thirty. How old am I? Thirty-seven. Thirty-eight. Got him at thirty-seven. And trying to teach this thing that doesn't understand English, Spanish, or whatever fucking language I speak, what I want from it was. An eye opener for me. I was like, "Oh shit!" So it doesn't matter what you know if that other person can't comprehend what you're trying to communicate. And with some people, that'll just be more natural, easier. With others, it's uh, you just fucking keep trying, I guess. The the other piece is look like I, I think that if you pick the wrong exercise, you're putting yourself so far behind the eight ball mm -hmm. that it's like, and and that's where like I I have. And look, you filmed it, okay? For every pattern, I have exercise number one, and I have a rule book that tells you why that's number one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, I see a lot of people try to, for exercise number one for a squat, they like back squat someone with a barbell. And I'm like, that's not gonna, unless you have a really good mover, like, and chance, like it's very rare to get that, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's just a bad choice. Like, but if you go with a heel elevated goblet squat, for instance, you're giving yourself a much higher probability of 
not having to say too much and them just being able to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the rules, it's like if you understand the essence of a squat pattern as, as kind of falling into an inhalation-based drill. And then you understand what are the joint actions associated with inhalation. And it's like, well, okay, it's, it's uh, you know, flexion, abduction, external rotation, and with that comes plantar flexion. Uh, then, then that kind of guides you in terms of being able to understand how to manipulate the drill in terms of how, how to put the arms here and how to elevate the heels because it feeds into the joint actions associated with what's needed to be able to do that particular movement versus a deadlift which is more of an exhalation based movement mm. and that's going to be internal rotation, extension, adduction and with that at the level of the foot comes dorsiflexion uh, and it's sort of like, well, in theory, if I elevate the toes a little bit and I have them holding an implement like this, like a kettlebell between their legs, that should feed into the concepts associated with being able to move the body in the way that a deadlift requires. Uh, so I, I really do think that like, uh, I, I would like to be able to create a strategic list that no matter how bad your communication skills are, it should guide you to being able to have higher success rate. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think, because I think both sides are important. Like, you know, you, you really do need to be able to understand how to get a message across to people, but you also need to set yourself up for success with the right first, uh, first choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you were talking about, I was just editing. Um, horizontal rowing you want to set them up with a chest support of course first yeah. before they're trying to like cable row or whatever yeah it's you know I think that ultimately you're you're learning the frustrations of the job mm -hmm. which mostly revolve around failures like mm -hmm. the person didn't do the drill properly they're not getting results and my brain just works like I, I hate to not get the outcome that I'm looking for it drives me crazy. I lose sleep over that kind of stuff, and I just want to problem solve it and figure out a rule book that I can put together where I never have the same problem again going forward. Uh, and you know, I I'm grateful for that kind of insanity. Mm -hmm. You know, because usually it does. Like I I actually kind of like to make mistakes uh, because it means that I have a chance to problem solve and fix that going forward to make fewer mistakes in the future. It's like uh, one of the more interesting examples is in the book Anti-Fragile by uh, Taleb, where he talks about every time there's an airplane crash is actually a good thing because... You if you're the, not on the airplane. Yeah, well, but the learning that comes from that is going to lead to fewer in the future. You know, the black box report that comes back to it, uh, every airplane crash that happens makes future airline travel safer. So it's like uh, every time that you have someone that it's so long as you actually analyze it properly and do something about it, it, it it's a it's an opportunity rather than actually like any kind of downside negative thing. Mm -hmm. And every trainer goes through that. I mean, you had a PhD coming into New York City trying to teach people about physiology who you know very successful people, smart in their own right, but I'm sure with some of them you couldn't get through. Yeah. And there's been some people, especially in the beginning of my career when I was training uh, clients, it was like talking to a fucking brick wall. And some people want to learn, others are easy to inspire. It's it's a big pool of fucking people. You don't know what you're going to get. Make the most of it. Yeah. But that's basically your rite of passage. All those failures or shortcomings or whatever. So. Yeah, you know, and... I don't know, like, uh, I think that there's different mentalities with generations. Like, we, mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't get participation awards, you know? Like, we didn't... Uh, and I'm not trying to be, like, the old guy yelling at millennials. Okay, boomer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, <laughs> I think that ultimately, you know, for whatever reason, like, kind of, like, our time period was more of, like, a... There was, the feeling at that time was more individu individualistic mm -hmm. and less cooperative and less teamwork oriented. 
and uh, and also like not particularly like uh, I don't know you weren't rewarded for just showing up and and like like either like sink or swim sort of a deal and it, it has changed but but to me like I've never I've I've learned so much from mistakes I really have like why would you ever you don't learn anything from success really you just get a reward from success. There's no motivation to actually change. Mm -hmm. Like you need to have that stick sometimes to actually change what you're doing. And uh, I think that people that are that are capable of actually admitting that they're not being successful and doing a good job, and they they're like, well, I have to change what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing? Number one, and what could I possibly do differently going forward? Like, you got a great opportunity there. So uh, that's that's just sort of I don't know. It's where I'm at. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, are there any specific if you put them in the best position they could be to succeed and they're still not grasping it, um, then do you try to do you have like tricks up your sleeve for the communication aspect that helps it be more successful or is it mostly just gonna be like you're talking about before, put them on a you know, in a goblet squad, or, you know, is that like the most important thing, or is there the communication that can actually make it better as well? So I got, I have all 10 things that I use to guide me, mm -hmm. 10 principles. The 10 commandments. Okay. So yeah, kind of. But uh, one of them is start, like, start bilateral stance, start mm -hmm. sagittal plane, start static, okay? If someone's doing something wrong, Keep them in place. Don't let them move. Or if you're going to approximate static, get out the metronome and time them. Make them go slower. Don't let them actually go outside the, the confines of that. And, and a lot of times what I find, like, what are the things that, like, if we're talking about a squat, for instance, what are the things that people typically screw up on a squat? Like, what's the biggest, worst thing that they do? Hinge. Probably. They hinge, but also, like, they just, nobody fucking actually squats. Oh, they don't hit depth? Yeah, like, it's just like, great, you did nothing. You moved two and a half inches. Like, that's not going to do anything. Yeah, they're just like, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. So, I make them, I just take out the old metronome, or I make them hold the position, and it's like, that's not the position we're in yet. Like, you have to keep going, mm -hmm. and you can physically just manipulate them and push them into it more and more and more mm -hmm. but I think that's a big one in terms of, of a tool that you can use and sure like if they're actually holding the position now you could if they are just hinging back you can adjust them mm -hmm. so those are the people I probably have least understood in my life and I talked to our friend from California Jesse a lot about it and he said we probably all are gonna have trouble like empathizing with those kind of people because we've all played sports and, like I did basketball and cross country and those sports you or for me at least I'm just in pain the entire time and I'm just pushing through pain to get to the end um, you know I'm not the fastest I'm not the strongest whatever but to finish the race you're just out of breath the whole time you just gotta like do it because everyone's watching and there's never a second where I'm like I'm just gonna half rep this or I'm not I'm not like gonna go to my full extent and uh, he said like some people who never did that as kids like they just like don't even have that mentality they'd want to quarter rep it they want to like yep. eighth rep it if yeah, they so, I mean imagine if you were uh, I don't know uh, upper east side mom in her late 40s who never did any of that stuff never felt that kinesthetic discomfort or whatever the fuck, I don't know what kind of word I would use for the description I would use, but yeah, uh, suffrage. just the suffrage, suffrage, and then, you know, you're 46 years old, and this fucking 21-year-old is like, all right, bitch, we're going to fucking sprints on the treadmill, she's like, this fucking blows, <laughs> I'd rather go watch fucking Good Morning America or some shit, it's a very foreign feeling that a uh -huh. lot of people aren't familiar with, and even for us, right, there's always that extra... Uh, rung that you could go up in terms of discomfort and then once you hit that watermark you're like oh this other shit isn't so bad but I think it is harder especially for city people who have lived a very coddled lifestyle who don't need to work out and just do it more as like a fucking purse or like a you know, pet dog mm -hmm. it's more of a luxury it's just like I just look Kyle I want to come in I really don't want to work out but I do want to work out 
and then in that instance, I think what we talked about in the last power hour was to give that person the concoction of drugs. Yeah. Uh, the cardio or, you know, different feelings. They got no engine. They can't go fast. You know what I mean? It's like they're, they're just, they, there's a critical period in like youth and adolescence development where you can neurologically learn how to be explosive. And if you didn't do things during that period and now you're 35 years old, and I'm trying to get you to jump or sprint or throw a ball. It's just like poop. Like there's just no, there's no horsepower. There's no gas pedal. It's everything's the same speed. And like I never even encountered that my whole life until I got down here and I saw people that like just have one gear and one gear only. And so like doing power work with them does nothing. So everything's aerobic all the time. So there's no intensity. So you just have to go with volume. Uh, and it's it's eye opening, but yeah, they they didn't do critical athletic things in a younger age, and they just will never have that ability. It's the same thing for range of motion too. Mm-hmm. If you reach about 19 years old, seems to be kind of the magic number, and you're very flexible, you will remain very flexible for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. even without stretching. If you get to 19 and you are tight. You will be tight for the rest of your life, no matter how much you stretch, because it's wired. It's 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 the neural the neurology of it. Like uh, basically, you know, the the brain descends down into uh, nerves that go out to the muscles, and the muscles that go out to the, the the nerves that go out to the muscles from the central nervous system are called motor neurons, and they go through a process called myelination, and the myelination is like the formalization of the connection. And the, it, it's like, you you remember dial-up internet, like how thin those cables are. And nowadays you look at the cables that connect to computers and they're fatter. Like that's the difference between immature neurons and alpha motor neurons that are myelinated. Mm-hmm. Is the, insul- is the myelination is the insulation that goes around it. It thickens it, it makes the speed of it faster. It, but it, once it's myelinated, it's fucking done. That's what you get, you are now wired You can rewire to a certain degree as an adult, but it is a terrible, elongated, hellacious process where you would completely have to alter your lifestyle. Mm. I would have to fucking move to Peru and like move eight hours a day through giant ranges of motion and lose a hundred pounds. And that, you know, that might rewire me. Um, But uh, 30 minutes of stretching uh, three times a week, is, is not enough to alter the the neurology at that point you know so it's it's like and especially for so the, the range of motion stuff and the power stuff it's like it's it's embedded it's a done deal at, at this point in adult life now that being said you just have to this like I said the patterns don't necessarily change what you do doesn't really change how you do it changes if I encounter these people that have no explosiveness whatsoever, what do I do with them? Higher reps, okay? It's like, you know, some people, a lot of times you train women that aren't very strong, and it's like the weight that they use for 25 reps is five pounds lighter than the weight that they use for one rep. You know, and it's like, that doesn't make any sense. This is not on the one RM chart, Mm -hmm. you know, but, I don't know. The one RM chart probably didn't test general population individuals in Manhattan that never did activities as a child outside of like bathing in the fucking Scrooge McDuck money bath. Golden bathtub. That's yeah. what I love about the Kaiser stuff is sometimes you can see the person hit their like peak power on the last rep of the set or something like that. Mm-hmm. And you're you're like trying to eager for it to be over. They're like, fuck it. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> But I'm like, there's no way they've actually fatigued themselves. If it's anti-fatigue. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's what I meant by th- what I've like learned the most from here is like what you just said, like the childhood stuff, like figuring out like what they did before coming to us, and how that's gonna translate into our time together. Yeah. While training, because like we all talk about that a bunch. And that's where you get into the psychological yeah too and the emotional connection and like you know you get clients that you don't like 
I bet you your parents probably wouldn't get along with their parents either. Mm. You know, it's like... <laughs> you have something you want to add to that? No, okay. But, you know... Do you agree or disagree? No, I agree. Oh, okay. I agree. It's just that my parents wouldn't want to meet anybody else. You know, like, those are the, like, I, I, you know, I've, I've, from books I've seen, because I had to really learn how to actually, like, interact with people on a personal level. I I mean, I was so bad at this stuff when I was, like, a teenager. It was unbelievable. Uh, I literally just books and things like that, like, oh, this is how you talk to other fucking humans. Um, And one of the best questions you can ask people, generally speaking, is about their childhood. Hey, where'd you grow up? What was it like there? Uh, You know. Like things like that, you kind of get into that area, and you can learn so much about somebody by like if they take off their silk glove and smack you with it and say "Silence, wench!" <laughs> that <be> my dumbass. <laughs> you guys probably didn't grow up in the same uh, socioeconomic or whatever fucking area. There was a guy at Peak that Ethan trained. It wasn't a session that Ethan had him in, but the guy arrived at the gym wearing like one of those equestrian suits. You know what I'm talking about? Like the tight white horse pants. The boots that go up, way up. And like, uh, he did the whole workout in his horse riding outfit. That's a badass dude. I'm going to go talk to Ethan and see if that guy needs a trainer. Yeah. I'm going to wear my ascot and my uncle when I train. He was also, like, multiple people had this guy and he just kept getting passed from trainer to trainer. He was considered to be the single worst client in terms of having to deal with this guy challenge of anyone at that gym did he keep like whipping them with that like horse well, thing like I remember <laughs> there was one story he came in he did a whole workout just wearing sunglasses he would like be on his phone while like doing reps sometimes he was just a fucking horrendous person apparently. so usually for people like that what I would recommend is a old school Wu-Tang uh, beat down uh, Staten Island style, like on a Saturday night, like 3 a.m. Like a station beat down? Or? No, not like an Apache line. Like it's straight up just like, I'm just bored and me and my 11 friends want to curb stop you. Okay. To yeah. teach you humility, of course. Sure, sure. I think this guy was also caught in some kind of a Ponzi made off type of scheme. Not surprised. Too, so. Yeah. So, I'll stop there before it. someone like figures out who this fucking dude is. <laughs> they already did. They already did. They already did. But yeah, every client you get is a different project. Some are going to make you better. Some are going to challenge you. So, and a lot them. of them are just kind of like, you know, you're sort of indifferent to them. Uh, it's 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 not the easiest job in the world from from that standpoint. But you do have to figure people out, you know. And uh, you know, one of my favorite statements is by Jim Ferris, and uh, it's your six p.m. client doesn't care that you had a 6 a.m. client, you know? You really have to, like the a professional puts a lot of shit to the side. And you recognize like, you know, this is this is my job, I have to bring the appropriate thing for this person, like I have to be present, I have to be here. It doesn't fucking matter that my house just burned down and like, you know, whatever is going on in your life doesn't really matter right now in this moment. If I go to eat at my favorite restaurant and I expect my steak, my $100 steak, to taste like a $100 steak every time, it should. If I go in one day and the same steak that I've always got tastes like a fucking TGI, like fucking a Friday's fucking Tuesday steak, like $10, I'm like, what the fuck? You guys change chefs? No, it's the same guy. He's just fucking tired. Fuck you guys. Eat a dick. Yeah. So what is what are you saying is the price point for the training? You have to get whatever whatever we're worth, we have to give that same value to that client. We're an expensive commodity. Right. So I want I want to maximize I don't want my clients to be like, Oh look, that guy over there at the corner of the gym is having a great session and a fun time with his with his uh, trainer. So I have to maximize my potential whether I'm having the worst day of my life or not. If it's if it's that bad of a day I take off. But you can't come in here and half-ass shit because people are going to read right through you anyway. I think sometimes, though, um, the value that they get out of it sometimes isn't even all the training. Like, because we were just talking about the psychological stuff. It's, oh my God, for, for, fuck, for most of the people here, it's probably more psychological. Men Um, or women. Like, so when I first got into fitness and understanding... 
what we were talking about bef- yesterday was which was like uh, the least amount that you need to train them to see a response or like the most and all that stuff in between I was like fascinated by that and I got into that and then if you try to tell someone to do that sometimes even though on paper that is the most like effective way to train them uh, it's not sustainable for them so do you ever change for the, any of those reasons like you say sometimes like you don't care if you give someone like a 30 30 and they like hate you and they never come back yeah, yeah, yeah. but most likely they're never gonna like find someone who can get them what they if they're like not happy with you yeah. most likely they're not gonna ever seek help from anyone else since you know we're all pretty good here you don't know that well I'm saying like they're not gonna I just feel like um there was a time where I wanted to do what was most optimal and then there was a time where I started realizing uh, how can I get people to do something like like I just said like 80% optimal but sustainable like get them keep coming back for more and more and more and they'll probably get way better results than trying to do like what was all optimal and then hating it and then never coming back yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean consistency and adherence you know, I sound like Ben House right now like those are the two most important variables in the whole game and whatever the fuck you need to do in the beginning to create consistency and adherence from that person is the show once you've established consistency and adherence now you can actually create a real program now you can take the fluff out now you can this is when the first time I did a, a, a round table with, with Mike uh, he fucking crushed it because he talked about the fuckery to training. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, and uh, basically it's like you have to recognize where the person is in front of you. How deep are they into fuckery and how far away from training are they? And you're always trying to funnel them away from fuckery and towards training. And there's a million things that can constitute fuckery. Like, you know, for example, like their weekend behavior could represent fuckery, okay? The exercises that they want to do or that they feel are the important ones are probably pure fuckery. Like, if we can get them to the point where we slowly over time nudge them and nudge them and nudge them and move them as far as we can away from fuckery, that's your job, Mm -hmm. you know? But, like, actually recognizing how to create that. Like, that's that's a really interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on, my leg's only there because that left hamstring was, like, starting to cramp and I didn't want to fucking shin kick. I didn't want to Muay Thai kick this table, which would have checked that kick. Uh, and then it would have been, like, was it Anderson Silva? Did he get his leg broken? But on a, yeah, it would like like that. Chris Fyden. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I love that fuckery training continuum. Do you have more stories of, like, the... The guy who like will probably be your client forever because of the tricep push down or whatever yeah. it was. Well, you know, I feel like. Uh, what was that story? Oh, share, uh, share it with the people for here. I guess. Yeah. So, is a guy that I see once a week, um, and he came into me. He got recommended by another client of mine, uh, and he was like. Listen, man, like, I've seen PTs, I've seen other people, like, I've just had this tricep problem. Every time I try to do any kind of tricep exercise, it just hurts really bad. So I was like, all right, well, let me just see your attempt at a tricep exercise. And it was like, you know, one of these deals where his arms are way out in front of him and he's just doing something like this on a tricep pushdown. And I'm like, all right, well, just anatomically, like the tricep doesn't just extend the elbow, it also extends the humerus and it adducts the humerus. So I just got him to bring his arms back and keep them in tight to his body and then do your extension. He's like, uh, that didn't hurt. It was like, all right, well, you know, this is what you have to do. And this guy is actually physically fairly competent. And like, I, I mean, with a lot of people, that's too much instruction. Mm-hmm. Where they're just like, bah, I don't know how to do anything. Like, uh, but it, as soon as we did that, he was like, that's crazy, man. Like, this has been years that this is a problem. We did this one rep this way, and it doesn't hurt at all. And uh, and it was like, all right, cool. Like, But it was like, the guy came in with something very specific. Like, most of the time, people don't actually come in with something that's that specific mm-hmm. in terms of 
this is my exact problem. Can you help me with this problem? Uh, and and it's like, actually, I, I can help you with this problem. Like, I'm pretty sure I know exactly what to do. And it worked. And now it's like the confidence level just comes up super high when that happens. And it's like, you're my fucking guy now. Uh, that's always like that's a layup though it's like an unguarded layup just cherry picking like hey I'm fucking open down here because I didn't play defense throw me the ball it's like okay he thinks you're a fucking wizard he's like this guy (laughs) you gotta meet this guy he's the most amazing trainer I've ever met yeah he keeps trying to pitch other people towards me but they're like, you know, I can, you know, like emails where you're like, oh, this is clearly like an unmotivated person that doesn't actually want to come and meet me because there's no reason for them to. They're probably fucking actually doing pretty good. They don't have a huge problem that like they can't solve. Like, and it's funny, like I remember talking to Ethan when I first came down here because I get down here and Ethan's doing real well. He's got clients. He's living in a nice apartment. I'm like, this will be a cakewalk. And, uh, and I get down here and no fucking clients. Like, of course, I start in July or June or something like that, which, you know, in retrospect is like... Stupid ass. Yeah, the worst. Like, I'm like, I didn't know that people went to the fucking south of France for, like, three months or something like that. Never heard of this shit. Yeah, like... There's nobody... And Peak is fucking this dying old cow out in the fucking field. Like, legitimately. There's no fucking new clients coming into that place. No grass to chew on. Nothing. It's a burned down fucking no. mess. Teeth to suck on either. It's not like any <laughs> trainers are gonna throw me clients. Like, you know, it just doesn't fucking happen. They're like, nah, man, this is my fucking money. Like, I'm not just throwing you my money. So, I'm like, just going fucking broke. And, uh, and then he, I'm like, dude, like, what the fuck? How did you get all these clients? And like, you know, there was a trainer that moved to LA to like nice. start, yeah. And, you know, he was able to just funnel all of his clients to Ethan. So it was a nice like start. But, you know, the other way that he got them was actually like people that are fucked up, people that are injured. And they're like, you know, or other trainers that are injured. And it's like, you know, those were the layups. Like, other trainers that are injured that are like, I don't know what to do, uh, fucking this hurts. I'm like, okay, quick assessment. Uh, you know, you can't get fucking air into this part of your lungs. Let's just do this drill that does that. And then all they're like, holy shit, this is, it's just fucking better. And, you know, that, that was a big piece for me of getting started. Of just, like, people that couldn't train because they were fucked up. And then all of a sudden... You have the tools to be able to actually help them, and then they refer you a client that's fucked up, and then that kind of got me going in terms of getting the ball rolling with, with being able to help people. And uh, I remember when I first got into training, it's like I didn't want to deal with people that were fucking injured. Like, and then I started getting hurt, and then I had to learn how to deal with that situation. And then I realized, like, oh, this is the fucking golden ticket. You know, that really is the thing. It's just you have to learn a lot and you have to learn outside the scope of just basic exercise science and like then you get in fucking arguments with fucking annoying people all the time about shit. You should write a book called Fragile because we already got Anson Fragile by Teleb. Yeah. You should just write Fragile. Yeah. My journey as a trainer in New York. That'd be interesting. We could just take the words that you talk from here and make it into text. But, um... So you found your niche as to, like, your clientele. Yeah. Um, what were some of the arguments that you got in with people? Uh, it's all the typical shit. Like, because the world of pain and injury is just, like, sort of... It's not as rock-solid a science as some other areas. Like, it's very... It's fucking easier to research muscular hypertrophy than it is to try to figure out, like, why does someone's shoulder hurt? Mm-hmm. You know, there's just way more gray area in the realm of pain and syndromes like that Mm -hmm. than there is in like fucking glycolysis like so you know you just get a lot of like camps that form in the world of like pain and rehab and like people are people are just egotistical and assholes and they're like where's the research to support this and it's like I don't know that fucking air fills up alveoli in the lungs and then when I, I fill a lung up it moves ribs and like if this zone is just not receiving air, uh, it's not going to expand into the ribs. And if the ribs expand backwards out in the back, they'll push into the scapula. 
And if I push into the scapula, you know, the muscles on the scapula will become active to resist that pushing. And by them becoming active, uh, they haven't been active in a while, they'll actually secure that thing in space and they'll reorient the socket of the arm bone. And now if I just orient the socket of the arm bone in the right way, now the arm actually rotates properly inside the socket. I don't know where the fucking research is on that. It's just a thing. There's also no research showing that fucking jumping out of a plane with a parachute is a better idea than jumping without the parachute. But I'm pretty sure fucking parachutes slow you down as you go through air because of friction. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, there's some things that are like, people are like, where's the research to show that heart rate goes up as exercise intensity increases? I don't fucking know. It was probably done 300 years ago. Like, nobody's <laughs> researching that. Like, it's not a thing. It's too basic. It's just that, like... The basics and the fundamentals are, are not things that people currently research, so I don't have a fucking PubMed article for that. Uh, but if you use your brain and you think about the way something works in front of you, then that's the thing. Like, so th you get Basically, they're saying, like, where's the research that shows the Earth is round? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's like, uh, fuck, I don't know, Columbus? Uh, Columbus <laughs> at all. Columbus, Pinta, Nina, Santa Marina et al., 1492. Fucking, yeah, Galileo, fucking Copernicus, 1513. Fucking America, yeah. Fuck these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Archimedes, fucking <laughs> B.C. 55. Like yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't fucking have it in my Rolodex. They don't the fucking. They don't even know what a Rolodex is. Do you remember? I think it was one eight hundred dentist. The yeah. commercial for that. <laughs> the, the, it was great because it was like one lady telling another lady about like, oh, I found my dentist on one eight hundred dentist. Like you should too. Let me get the number for you. And she looks through the Rolodex. And pulls out the card for one. It's one eight hundred dentist. You already told her the number. You don't need to go through the Rolodex to get the physical number. Maybe the lady had dementia. That's possible. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, kids. On that note, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, of course. Send us more fucking questions. Maybe they probably are, and we don't know it. Oh but yeah, man. we don't even check it. That's Kyle's job, but. That's problem. That's the fucking problem. Kyle just wants to ask the questions. Look at this. It's like we've solved the riddle of the Sphinx. Well, if you, you are you out of time? Ah, oh, damn it! I wanted to hear more Marcus's story. Until I'll tell you when the cameras off. Tell us about the. We got Brazzers coming in. Coming in next. Oh. Yeah, I haven't noticed the setup. <laughs> casting couch coming at you. Twins podcast to casting couch. Gotta love this back room. Yes, sir. Well. It's been a pleasure for you, America. All right. Peace out, guys. See you next week.